Thanks for checking out this video. What you're about to watch is a message from our sermon series entitled Advancing the Gospel with Joy at Great Hills Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. Our church walked through the entire book of Philippians together, and I hope that these messages encourage you as much as they did our church. Check the description of this video for links to other messages in this series and enjoy. Amen, thank y'all so much for leading us in worship. I mean, I was sitting down there, I was getting all excited about to walk up, and I felt like the Lord was like, you know, just, just sit down for a second, just kind of gather your thoughts, gather your things. And I was looking, and all my pages in my manuscript were all out of order. So I was like, oh, well, thank you, Lord. That would have been, been rough, getting up here and then all being out of order. So God is good. So, uh, well, let's pray, and we'll, we'll get jumping in. Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for this day, God. Uh, thank you for each person that's here. Lord, it's not by coincidence, um, that we're here, God, but um, you are constantly drawing people to yourself, Lord. I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be that day where you draw them to yourself. And God, those of us who are here, maybe we've been a believer for a week or we've been a believer for 70 years, God, you are still drawing us close to you, wanting uh, us to know you on a deeper level, God, and we're just grateful that we uh, continue to, to learn more and more about you. You are such an awesome, amazing God. And I just believe that we'll spend our entire lives learning more about you, God, and we'll spend all of eternity just learning about the greatness uh, of you in heaven, Lord. Uh, so we just love you so much, and uh, we just pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, so today we continue in our sermon series, Advancing the Gospel with Joy, and I am humbled and honored to be able to open up the Word of God with you this morning and to study it. And as I was beginning preparation for this sermon, it was just a good, humbling experience from the Lord. He just reminded me that His Word does not need my help, all right? His Word is going to go out and accomplish exactly what He wants it to. And in fact, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So today we will open up God's word and we are gonna let the word of God do the work, amen? You don't need to hear my thoughts and opinions. You need the truth of God's word to permeate your heart and to do the work that the Lord wants it to accomplish in you. And you may be here this morning and thinking, what could verses written 2,000 years ago have to do with me today? Well, I, think, I think that's a fair question, but I would return that question uh, with a qu another question to you and ask you, do you have at least one problem in your life? And if you're, yeah, I hear some laughing there. So if you, if you answer yes uh, to that question, then Philippians 4, 1 through 7 is for you. Uh, we are gonna read in a few moments the Apostle Paul uh, talk about some real struggles that Christians face in this life, like uh, arguments, a lack of graciousness and joy, and anxiety as well. And so remember also that Paul is writing to arguably his most impressive church that he planted, all right? He is uh, writing to the church at Philippi, uh, but even the most impressive church in the world, the best church in the world, is made up of Christians who still struggle with sin, all right? And we still need God's word uh, to correct us. And so this morning, we're gonna look at Philippians 4, 1 through 7. I've titled my message, Stand Fast and Rejoice. And would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? Okay, so Philippians 4, 1 through 7, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and I long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Now I appeal to Euodia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Thank you, you may be seated. 
All right, so today we're gonna look at these seven verses uh, in Philippians and see what the Lord wants to reveal to us. And so point number one is don't give up in your relationship with Jesus. Don't give up in your relationship with Jesus. Verse one says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. Uh, Or you may see your Bible say, stand fast in the Lord. Paul says, I love you and I long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. So Paul begins uh, this chapter with the word therefore. And as my dad always says, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to find out what it is there for. And so Paul is linking together what he said at the end of chapter three, which uh, Pastor Brandon Bales did a great job last week leading us through that, uh, those scripture verses. And so at the end of chapter three, Paul spoke about our heavenly citizenship and our hope in the Lord Jesus's return. And as a result of these realities, we should never give up in our relationship with the Lord. No matter what comes at you in this life, you have to continually endure in your Christian walk. Oftentimes you'll hear people say that they are no longer a Christian or that they have walked away from the faith or, you know, they'll say something along the lines of, oh yeah, I tried that whole Christianity thing and, you know, it just didn't really work out for me. Well, I would argue that those people were never truly believers because if you are a believer, then you will endure in your faith until Jesus returns or he calls you home. And now that doesn't mean that you won't deal with struggles or uh, wandering in this life. Um, I think of uh, the prodigal son. You can see how he walked away from the father for a little while, but he eventually repented and returned uh, to his relationship with his father. And two examples I think of in the Bible when it comes to wandering versus walking away are Peter and Judas. So Peter denied even knowing Jesus Uh, three different times, but Peter eventually repented of his sin and returned to Jesus. Judas, however, chose to betray Jesus and walk away from his relationship with him. And so if you are here today and you have been wandering in your relationship with the Lord, I would encourage you to repent and return to him like Peter did and not to abandon the faith like Judas. Paul then uses the strongest Greek word for for love when he says, I love you to this church. He then says that they are his joy and the crown that he receives for his work. The joy of seeing his beloved Philippians grow more like Jesus motivated Paul's exhortation to stand firm to them. The Philippians were also Paul's crown, and Paul uses the Greek word stephanos for crown, which describes the crown that was given to an athlete when they had won an athletic event. It was similar to a trophy or a plaque that someone might receive today. And I'm not talking about the participation trophy, right, that we all receive just for showing up. No, I'm talking about the trophy that you get for being first, for being the best, and for winning. And I'm sure like many of you who watched the Olympics over these past couple weeks, uh, that was something my wife and I really enjoyed. Uh, We'd put the babies to bed, right, and we would watch the the late night NBC uh, of all the different events. And uh, one that just especially stood out to me uh, was the men's uh, four by 100 medley relay, and that was the swimming, okay? And so the, the men had never lost this event in the history of the Olympics. As long as they had been doing this race, uh, the U.S. men had always come in first. And so here, you know, we were excited. We we're thinking like, oh man, they're gonna come in first again. And so we're watching it, and it's neck and neck with China the, and the entire time. And then China actually ended up beating the United States by about half a second. So close race, but by about half a second. And, you know, we see like the in real time, you know, it's like China won, US two, and then it shows the other, but they don't know. The swimmers don't don't really know uh, who won and whatever. So they're all standing up there waiting for the official results. And they showed the US men's faces when they came in second, when they got silver. And y'all, you would have thought that they came in last place. You would have thought they didn't even qualify for the Olympics. I mean, they were so disappointed. And I was just watching that and I was like, it's so interesting because in some of the events, the person who wins bronze was more excited than the person who won gold. You know, they're just jumping up and down. But I thought it was so interesting and it it got me thinking, I was like, well, why are they so disappointed? And it was because their expectation was first, right? The expectation, the standard was gold and they didn't reach that expectation, But the church in Philippi, they were the gold standard, all right? They were the best, they were first, and they were proof that Paul's work in ministry had been effective. Point number two is pursue like-mindedness with other believers. Pursue like-mindedness with other believers. 
Uh, verse number two says, now I appeal to Euodia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. And so we don't know much about Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, all we know is that they were two prominent women in the church at Philippi and they were having a disagreement, all right? And it may seem a little surprising that Paul would talk about a seemingly mundane matter after his amazing doctrinal material in chapter two and his warnings against false teachers in chapter three. But Paul understands the importance of unity in the church. When disunity and discord creeps into a church, it can ruin the church's testimony to an onlooking world. Your doctrine can be sound and your pastors can be pure, but if a church is not unified, then it will rob the church of its power and destroy its integrity. That's why Paul pleads with these women to settle their disagreement, uh, to literally be of the same mind in Christ, and we can assume from this passage that these women weren't arguing over an important doctrinal issue. Uh, if they were, Paul did this time and time again in his letters. He would simply agree with the person who was right and he would correct the person who was wrong. Um, but, so it appears that these women were arguing over something that was merely a preferential issue. It reminds me kind of when uh, Danielle and I, we like to go on walks, all right? That is like our thing. Uh, we eat dinner and then we strap the kids into our little double stroller and we go on our little walks. And so, but we have very different ideas of what it means to go on a walk, all right? It's kind of like what Pastor Brandon was talking about last week. I think that the journey, different people have different ideas of what a journey goes on. I could so relate to that because I started thinking about us and going on walks because Danielle, if anybody knows Danielle, she is a go-getter, all right? She is a mom of two. She's a postpartum nurse. I mean, she's, she's got schedules. She, she's got everything planned out in a day. And so when we're about getting ready to go on a walk, you know, we strap them in, she's thinking, okay, you know what we'll do? We'll walk 15 minutes. We'll kind of get right at the 15 minute mark. We'll stop, we'll turn around, we'll get back to the house. We'll get the babies out of the uh, stroller. We'll, we'll put them to bed we'll, at 8.30 and then, and then we're done and we can kind of rest. So anybody like that? Anybody, is that kind of your... Okay, well, you're not in the, the majority there, all right? So you may be a little bit more like me, all right? So my idea of a walk is you just take your time, all right? You're just enjoying life and walking. You're looking at the, I'm looking at the trees and like, wow, look at that beautiful sunset. And oh, maybe this person, we've never met them before. Let's stop and, and talk to them. And maybe we get to the 15 minute point and there's a park there, you know? And it's like, well, wouldn't it be great to let the kids out and play at the park and enjoy it and then take our time, go going back. And so clearly those are two different ways uh, to enjoy a, a walk. And who, who is right in that scenario? I am, right? I'm, I'm the one that's right. No, no, neither of us is right, right? It's a preferential uh, issue there, okay? And so what we normally do is we compromise, okay? So usually on the way there to the 15 kind of minute mark, we'll kind of just take our time and just kind of talk and enjoy. And then once we kind of get to that halfway point, we'll turn around and we'll kind of kick it into high gear a little bit. Or whoever's pushing the stroller, they kind of get to set the pace. And so if I'm doing it, I'm taking it slow. But if she's doing it, she's going a little bit faster. And so, but as you can see, it's, it's a compromise that we have with one another. We don't let it get in the way of our marriage or get in the way of our desire to go on a walk. Uh, it's, it's preferences. And so in the same way, that's what Paul is getting at with these ladies. He's saying, hey, these are preferences that you have. And so how does Paul encourage these women to resolve the issue? He first appeals to them uh, to resolve their differences with one another. He says, look, you two women love the Lord Jesus and you have even helped me in sharing the gospel to a lost world. He's saying, humble yourselves and put the other above yourself and resolve this matter for the sake of the unity of the entire church. And maybe you're here today and you are in agreement, in agreement with someone in our church or with another believer. And you may think, oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I'll just continue to avoid that person and harbor bitterness towards that person and no one will ever know. Well, first, uh, God knows and he sees your heart. And second, that kind of attitude actually hinders the unity and the effective witness of your church to a lost and dying world. If Paul were writing a letter to the church of Great Hills, he would actually start calling you out by name. 
All right, I I have to admit, when I first read this section, I, I kind of laughed a little bit because I just thought, and I imagined what these women were, were thinking, Sit, sitting in church, ready, and um, they found out that the Apostle Paul had written their church a letter. And I, and I think about, besides Jesus writing you a letter, I mean, if the Apostle Paul is writing you a letter, that's kind of a, a big deal. And so they sit down, and the pastor begins reading the letter, and as we've been studying over these past several weeks, I mean, I'm sure very early on they realized, wow, this is an inspired book. This is an inspired word of God, chapters one, chapters two, on uh, being humble like Christ, and then that, that amazing two, chapter two, one through 11, uh, imitating Christ, you get to chapter three, talking about false teachers and talking about the hope that we have uh, in eternity with Jesus, our resurrected bodies, and then they get to chapter four. And can you imagine the shock and just probably bewilderment of these ladies when they hear Paul start calling them out by name for their sin? I bet this was quite the wake-up call for these ladies. Paul then encourages some of the elders in the church, one who is called my true partner and one whose name is Clement, to help these two ladies resolve their issues. True partner can also be translated as yoke fellow, and refers to someone who shares a common burden. It has the picture of two oxen pulling the same load, right? So you wouldn't put one bigger oxen and one smaller oxen together because the bigger one would be uh, carrying more of the weight. Uh, And you wouldn't put one stronger one and one weaker one. No, you would put equal size and you're both pulling and straining and urging alongside with one another. And so this was someone that Paul knew and that he had an especially strong bond with. It would be kind of like if I was um, referring to the, our church at Great Hills and I said, uh, to the love of my life, to my soulmate, to my partner in this life, all right, well, none of you are my soulmate or my partner in this life. That would be Danielle, right? So she would know clearly that I'm talking to her and addressing her. Well, in the same way, whoever Paul's yoke fellow or true partner was, uh, he understood the message and he understood that Paul was talking to him or her. And then Clement, on the other hand, his name is mentioned explicitly here, uh, but we aren't exactly sure who he is. Uh, There was, I found this interesting, there was a very notable Clement in the early church who was the leader of the church in Rome and actually wrote two preserved letters to the church in Corinth. Uh, But we don't know if this was the same Clement as uh, that name was a very common name in the Roman world. Uh, but we do know and can assume that Paul and, Paul's true partner and Clement were elders in the church who were being asked to help these two ladies agree with one another. And Paul is being consistent here with his other letters on church discipline. Uh, we should first look to be reconciled to one another. And if that cannot happen for whatever reason, then we should go to others in the church who we trust that can help us resolve our issue. And then don't miss what Paul says at the end of verse three. He says, and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. So the book of life is the register where God keeps the names of the redeemed. All right, so does anybody remember the old church directory? Okay, okay, I just wanted to see if there was anybody out there. Okay, so for those of you who are younger, all right, just uh, humor us for a second as we just reminisce on the good old days of the old church directory, all right? So there was a Sunday back in the day where we would all get dressed up, and I mean dressed up more than you usually would get dressed up, all right? So if you were a t-shirt kind of guy, you were putting on a button-up, okay? If you were a button-up kind of guy, you may have had a suit jacket on, And then we would all stand in this uh, long line. I don't know how you remember it. This is how I remember it as a little kid. Standing in this long line and waiting to get our picture taken in front of this old blue backdrop, all right? And then months later, you would receive a copy of the church directory with the pictures and the names of each person in your family along with everyone else in the church's picture and contact information. Well, in the same way, God has a big C church directory in heaven with the names and pictures of every single person who has ever believed on the Lord Jesus as their savior. And so I must ask you today, is your name and picture in God's book of life? If it is, well, praise the Lord, because you will spend eternity in heaven with him and everyone else who has been saved throughout all of human history. But if your name is not written in the book of life, then you will stand before Jesus one day and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you, and you will spend eternity in hell. And so if you want to ensure that your name is in the book of life this morning, 
What you need to do is to repent of your sins and admit to God that you are a sinner in need of Jesus' saving work on the cross. You believe that Jesus is God's son and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and arose from the dead three days later. And if you do that, then your name will have already been written in the book of life because God knows exactly who is going to accept his son and who is not. Point number three is rejoice in the Lord. Verse four says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So again and again throughout this letter, Paul is urging believers to be full of joy in the Lord. And you may be thinking to yourself, how can we be commanded to produce an emotion? Right? He's saying it again, he, all throughout this, this letter, rejoice, be joyful. Well, how can I conjure up a feeling over and over again? Well, one commentator I read said, but joy is not an emotion or a feeling. It is the deep down confidence that God is in control of everything for the believer's good and his own glory. And thus all is well, no matter what the circumstance, end quote. As we've mentioned before, joy can only be found in a personal relationship with Jesus. It isn't circumstantial, uh, but positional. So if you are positionally in right standing with God through the blood of Jesus, then you have access to joy. And knowledge of God is key to rejoicing. Let me say that again. Knowledge of God is key to rejoicing. Those who know the great truths about God that have been revealed to us in his word find it easy to rejoice. Those who have little knowledge of God and his goodness and his character find it hard to rejoice. And joy allows you to be happy and to rejoice in the Lord no matter what your circumstance. Oftentimes I will marvel at the joy a believer has in difficult circumstances. Acts 5, 40 through 41 talks about the joy the early apostles had after being flogged. Verse 40 says, his speech persuaded them and they called the apostles in and had them flogged. And that word flogged literally means beaten or skinned. So they were beaten so bad that the skin on their back was literally peeling off. It's like the, the 39 lashes that, that Jesus received as well. Uh, it says, then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And then get this, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. I'll never forget my sophomore year of college at Dallas Baptist University, receiving the horrifying news that three of our classmates had died in a car crash just off campus. Um, Again, it's still to this day, it's hard to talk about just because DBU is a small uh, Baptist college uh, where everybody knows everybody. And so uh, this news just totally rocked our student body to the core. And we had a funeral for those three students who died and the chapel was packed with students and family members of the three students uh, who died. And I'll never forget looking over and seeing the family of one of the students. It was his parents, his mom and dad, and his older brother, the entire room stood up to sing the old hymn, Give Me Jesus, and I watched in amazement as this family sang praise to the Lord. The parents sang through tear-filled eyes, and the brother lifted up his hands to the Lord in praise and just had the most peaceful smile on his face. Even in the midst of the most tragic of circumstances, these believers still had joy because they knew that they would see their son and brother again one day in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14 says, and now dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. The joy of the Lord and the hope of eternal life should encourage the believer more than anything else. And then point number four is be known for graciousness. And this comes from verse five. It says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. <clears throat> Remember the Lord is coming soon. Or some of your Bibles may say uh, the Lord is near. And so Paul adds on to his command to rejoice in the Lord with a command to be considerate in all you do. And the Greek word epiakeia is translated as considerate here. Uh, but it can also be translated as reasonableness, gentleness, moderation, gentle spirit, or graciousness. And most commentaries I read agreed that the word uh, graciousness would be probably the most appropriate translation here. 
And so Paul is saying to be gracious in your interactions with believers and non-believers alike. We shouldn't be selfish and self-promoting, but willing to be graciously humble. Pastor John MacArthur says, quote, it's the humble graciousness that produces the patience to endure injustice, disgrace, and mistreatment without retaliation, bitterness, or vengeance, end quote. It's the ability to believe Romans 12, 19, which says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And it describes a person who is able to let go of their anxieties and preferences and trust that the Lord will take up their cause and work out things for their good. Two examples I think of when it comes to graciousness in the Bible, both center on Jesus's interactions with people. The first is how Jesus showed gentleness to the woman who was set up by the religious leaders and caught in the act of adultery. Go back and read that story and you will see Jesus show an amazing um, and holy gentleness and kindness to this woman. The other example is Jesus on the cross. 1 Peter 2.23 says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. A gracious person will entrust himself to the Lord and let the Lord fight his battles. Paul then reminds the church that the Lord is near. The word near can mean either in space uh, or in time. And so I could say that I am near this podium and that would be a correct usage of that word. But I could also say that lunchtime is near, all right? And that would also be uh, a correct use of the word. And so some take this in a chronological sense and believe that Paul is referring to Christ's return or to the believer's death in which we are ushered into the presence of the Lord. In that sense, the Lord's imminent return should uh, cause us to live sold out for Jesus in the present. But the immediate context of the passage would have you to believe that Paul is speaking of near in terms of the Lord's presence. The Lord is near to the believer. He is not far off in a distant God that cannot be bothered. No, he is close to his children and he is ready to help. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Psalm 73, 28 says, the nearness of God is my good. And Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. Because the Lord Jesus is near to us, we don't have to be fearful, worried, anxious, or wavering in our faith. Paul's call to the believers in verses one through five to resolve our distance differences, uh, continually rejoice, and be gracious to one another are possible because of the Lord's closeness to us and his working power in us. And this understanding of the Lord's presence is really gonna help and be a good segue into our next two verses, um, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Uh, but before we get there, point number five is relieve anxiety through prayer. Relieve anxiety through prayer. Verse six says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Because the Lord's presence is near us by his Holy Spirit, we can be anxious for nothing. Paul commands us not to worry about anything. This is not an option or a suggestion or, oh, hey, here's a good idea not to worry. No, it's a command from Paul. Do not worry about anything. John Piper says that anxiety seems to be an intense desire for something accompanied by a fear of the consequences of not receiving it. Let me say that again. It says anxiety seems to be an intense desire for something accompanied by a fear of the consequences of not receiving it. So we will desire, th basically what, what's that saying is we'll desire things like money, relationships, a job, good health, kids or a spouse. And these things are not bad desires in and of themselves, but they become destructive when we obsess over them and worry about not receiving them. We imagine the future in a worst case scenario and then start worrying about it. I've heard it said that over 90% of what we worry about never comes to reality, but that doesn't stop us from worrying about it, does it? Anxiety can also have spiritual and physical consequences. Anxiety is a joy killer and will make you totally self-absorbed. When you're anxious, you are less likely to serve others. 
you're less likely to obey the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Instead, worry distracts you and keeps you focused on yourself rather than on the mission the Lord has called you to. Medical experts tell us that anxiety also has physical consequences that can involve unusual mood swings, irritability, anger, sweating, rapid heartbeat, chest pain, exhaustion, nervous twitching, decreased concentration and memory, nausea, shortness of breath, hair loss, weight gain or weight loss, panic, indecisiveness, canker sores, muscle tension, insomnia, self-medicating, high blood pressure, eating comfort foods, and reckless driving. So who, who wants to sign up, sign up for that, right? So clearly, anxiety has a crippling effect on our physical health. According to a report by the American Psychological Association, 91% of Gen Z have high levels of anxiety and stress. So Gen Z are those that have been born within the period of 1997 to 2012. So that's ages 11 to 26. 91% of them have high levels of anxiety and stress. One third of those in Generation Z also struggle with suicidal thoughts. So clearly anxiety is a pervasive problem in our society and in our world. And so what is the cure? Is there any hope uh, for this problem? And Paul would say emphatically, yes, there is a cure to this problem. And the answer is to pray to God about everything. There is nothing off limits when it comes to prayer. God invites us time and time again in his word to pray about everything and to never stop praying. And so that doesn't mean that we all become monks and nuns and just spend all day every day with our heads bowed and eyes closed, right? What he's saying is that you have an attitude of prayer all throughout the day. From the moment you wake up, you should begin your conversation with God before your feet even hit the floor to start your day, start praying. And you can pray something along the lines of, thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. I surrender my will to you and humbly bow before your Lordship over my life today. Give me wisdom today. Take me to the places you would have me to go and allow me to talk to the people you would have me talk to. Your word says that I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Walk with me throughout this day, Lord Jesus. And I know many Christians who have started the practice of not even saying amen at the end of their prayer because they know that they are going to continually go back to God in, in prayer. They keep it just kind of open-ended, which, which I love that. I think that's cool. And as your day goes along, pray to God about everything. Thank him for all that he has done in your life. Start a prayer journal and start writing down all the things that you are grateful for. The ACTS acronym is a great way to pray. It's actually what we were doing just about 30 minutes before the service started. Uh, we are praying together right down here at the altar at 10.30 uh, during our house of prayer, and we pray through the ACTS acronym. And so if you are not attending that, I would highly encourage you to come and to learn how to pray, right? Praying doesn't come naturally uh, to a lot of us. I think about the disciples, uh, of all the things they could have asked Jesus for, you know, I mean, they were following Jesus, they could have said, Jesus, teach us how to preach or teach us how to share the gospel effectively. Teach us how to raise people from the dead or to walk on water or to take a few uh, bread and fish and to multiply it and feed thousands, but they didn't say teach us how to do those things. They said teach us how to pray. Prayer is something learned. It's something you have to be taught. And so the A in the ACTS acronym stands for adoration, where you adore God and you praise him for who he is and what he has done throughout human history and in your own life. I like to think of the ACTS acronym and then the Lord's Prayer are kind of the two ways I'll, I'll, I'll model my prayers. And one of the things with the ACTS acronym uh, I love to do is just to kind of close my eyes when I'm praying, maybe open up, open up my hands, and I'll just start to think about heaven, all right? Just start thinking about God's throne room, right, where God is seated on the throne with Jesus at the right hand. You think about all of the angels and the saints uh, surrounding Jesus, you look at Revelation and think of the four living creatures who all they do is they bow down and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And you just imagine heaven, you imagine the glory of heaven, the glory of God. You think about all honor, dominion, power, glory, everything is his. 
And it's very natural that as you're doing that, um, to kind of have the same response that the prophet Isaiah had. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord and he very quickly realized, oh my goodness. He says, woe is me, I am a sinner and I live amongst a bunch of sinners, all right? So it'll be very natural as you're just glorifying God and seeing his holiness and justice that you see yourself truly as you are and as a sinner. And so C stands for confession. Confess your sins to the Lord throughout the day. Um, Take my bad example of, I used to, um, you know, start the ACTS acronym in the morning, and so I would kind of pray through this, and so I would confess my sins, and then I would go an entire day, and then I would wait the next morning to con- start confessing my sins again. Well, you have a lot of junk and sins that have piled up over the day, so rather than doing that, just continually confess your sins to the Lord, uh, regularly humbling yourself before Him and asking Him for forgiveness. And then T stands for Thanksgiving. All throughout the day, thank the Lord. Thank him for every little thing you can think of. Um, One article I read had this to say about gratitude. It said, gratitude has been proven to be closely tied to mental health and life satisfaction. People who regularly practice gratitude have been found to experience more joy, love, and enthusiasm. They also experience fewer destructive emotions, such as envy, greed, and bitterness. Gratitude also creates physical benefits. People who practice gratitude have been found to recover from illness more quickly and cope with stress more easily. They also tend to have lower blood pressure and stronger immune systems. That's quite a contrast between the anxiety and that. I think all of us would sign up uh, for that. And then the S in the ACTS acronym stands for supplication. And this is an invitation to tell the Lord what you need. Even though God is all-knowing, all-powerful, he knows everything, right? He knows the very number on your, of hairs on your head. He knows uh, the, the day you take your last breath. He knows everything, but he's inviting you to tell him what you need. I think that's just absolutely amazing that the God of the universe wants to have a conversation with you. He's crazy about you, he loves you, and he wants to talk to you. And I just wonder how many of our prayers go unanswered because we don't simply ask God for anything. Psalm 37, four says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. So as you adore God, you confess your sins to him and you thank him for all that he has done, uh, then you will have a better understanding of what to ask of him. And then verse seven ends with a promise. Don't, don't miss this, this is so good. Paul says that if you will not worry, uh, but instead pray to God about everything and thank him for all that he has done, then God will give you his peace. All right, by a show of hands, who here has ever experienced the peace of God? Okay, I want you to keep your hands up, all right? Okay, keep your hands up. So if you experienced uh, the peace of God and it was not all that great, all right? It wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And in fact, it was kind of disappointing, all right? Something you really wouldn't want to experience again. So if that was your experience with peace, all right? It just wasn't that great. I want you to put your hand down. All right, so look around. Most everybody who has their hands still up, um, and I think those of us that maybe put our hands down, maybe I didn't explain the the question very well, because look around, most of us have your hands up, so you can put your hand down, and that's because there is nothing in this world like God's peace. Paul says that it exceeds anything we can understand. It is literally beyond our ability to explain and therefore must be experienced. It's kind of like childbirth. All right, so that's clearly something I've never experienced as a male, uh, but something that my wife has experienced on two different occasions. Uh, She's had two unmedicated deliveries, one 39 hours and one 15 hours. Um, So we're hoping it just keeps, you know, getting less and less as she keeps going along. Uh, Not to say that she's pregnant or anything, but I'm just saying in the future, we would like that. Um, But she can explain all she wants to someone who has never given birth what that experience is gonna be like. All right, but words are not gonna do it justice. That woman is going to have to experience the moment for herself to understand the magnitude of the moment. And it's the same for God's peace. You have to experience it for yourself. It cannot be experienced for you. One of my favorite uh, Christian artists right now is Maverick City, and they have a song called Firm Foundation. And so listen to these lyrics. It says, I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength because I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through every season. So why would he fail now? 
He won't, he won't. The peace of God allows you to never give up no matter the circumstance. And then Paul says that this peace which God gives will guard your hearts, which are your emotions, and guard your mind, which are your thoughts as you live in Christ Jesus. And the word guard speaks of a military action. Just as soldiers guard and protect a city, so God's peace guards and protects believers who confidently trust in him. And so if you're here today and you have experienced the unexplainable peace of God, then you know exactly what Paul is describing here. But even as Christians, we can waver in our peace. We can allow the worries of this life to overwhelm us. In those instances, remember these verses uh, from Paul. Better yet, memorize these verses from Paul. I just think if you're a Christian in the 21st century and you don't have Philippians 4, 6, and 7 memorized, I don't know how you make it, all right? Because these are just amazing, amazing verses to get your heart and mind right. And so remember these verses, memorize them, and then put them into practice. And also remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And so I'm gonna read this uh, passage. It's, it's 10 verses, so it's a little bit uh, of, of a long passage, but this is the verses on do not worry. All right, if you wanna know, okay, what did Jesus have to say about worry? Uh, these were the verses, and they are so incredibly encouraging, encouraging, especially those of you who are really dealing with anxiety this morning to just let these words wash over you. Maybe close your eyes, uh, just open up your hands, just, just make this moment with, between you and God and just receive uh, these words from Jesus. Jesus says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So if you are here today and you have never experienced the peace of God, then I would encourage you to give your life to Jesus this morning. You will never be at peace until your sins are forgiven. Let me say that again. You will never be at peace in this life until your sins are forgiven. And the way you receive forgiveness of sins is by admitting to God that you are a sinner in need of Jesus. Romans 10, 19 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I encourage you to make that your prayer this morning and then join in with the rest of us who had our hands raised earlier in experiencing the most amazing peace imaginable. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for your word, God. Thank you that it is um, so applicable to what we are dealing with today uh, in our 21st century, God. Thank you that you don't um, leave us on our own, God. You give us uh, the amazing inspired word of God uh, to feed us, uh, to help us, or to draw us closer to you in our relationship with you. Um, and just thinking about... Uh, that guy who asked me the other day, just said, you know, I, I wanna get closer to the Lord. How, how do I get closer? And just encouraging him that through Jesus to, to read your Bible and to pray. God, thank you that you have not left us on our own, uh, but you have given us amazing avenues to know you more, God. And so would, that, would you make that our heart's desire, Lord, to, to read your word, uh, to study it, God, and then also to pray, Lord. And help us be... Um, patient with ourselves, God. None of us are gonna be expert prayers uh, as we first start out, God, but um, I pray that you would just protect our hearts and our minds. We know uh, the enemy is gonna do everything he can uh, to keep us from praying. He is going to throw everything at us and, and kill our prayer life before it even begins. And so Lord, would you just uh, remove those barriers, remove those distractions. God, help us to put up our phones, put up uh, media, Lord, and just um, realize how important 
uh, speaking to you and, and having that personal relationship with you is, Lord. And God, I do just pray, again, if there's anybody here uh, that has never experienced peace and salvation, it's an amazing experience at the moment, um, just being justified before the Lord, having your sins forgiven, uh, but it's also a life of peace, a life of just knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you have uh, an eternity in heaven waiting for you with Jesus, and uh, that it's not based on circumstances. It's not based on good times or bad times. No matter what, you can have that peace. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't have that, Lord, that they would give their lives to you this morning. And God, we just love you so much. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Help us to glorify him and honor him in everything we say and do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for checking out this video. For links to other messages in this series, click the link on the screen. If you're interested in knowing more about our church or want to join our live worship service online, check out the links in the description.